Hey everybody, Pastor Ron of Grace Bible Ministries in Ogden, Utah. I just wanted to make a video because you YouTubers may really find this very helpful. But you can actually upload videos from your phone to your YouTube channel. It might revolutionize your your account. But anyway, uh, I just discovered this feature. As I like to say, old man with technology, beware. Um, but anyway, I wanted to give my personal testimony, witness uh, of Christ and how I came to saving faith in, in Christ. And, and really, I want to magnify the simplicity of it. And uh, I love to call it easy believism. I was saved by Christ through easy believism because it's easy. It's not difficult. It's not uh, a bizarre thing in, in Scripture to believe the truth of the gospel. So before I get started, most most YouTubers bail uh, 39 second point. I'm already past that. So let me tell you how you can come to know that you have eternal life and that your sins are forgiven by finding refuge in the mercy of God. Fleeing to refuge in the mercy of God. And mercy is not getting what you deserve. So we've sinned and we deserve the wrath of God. We've rebelled against his his holiness and righteousness, and we are rebels, uh, rebel creatures, and we deserve his wrath. But the good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth, and may I say easy believeth uh, in him, uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. So here's my story, um, how I came to saving faith or easy believism in Jesus Christ. Um, as a kid, I was very sensitive. My conscience was very sensitive. I knew when I did something wrong, my conscience would smite me. Uh, I tried to be a good boy, and for the most part, I was a good little boy. Uh, I did come from a broken home with a lot of dysfunction there, but um, uh, my mom was faithful, loved me, took care of me. Um, and uh, so anyway, I lived... Uh, I lived a pretty clean life, you know, until the teen years came along, and um, very sensitive to my sin, and I always uh, was aware, uh, I was very sensitive to the fact that if I died, I would go to hell. I would suffer torment because of my sins. Now, on the outside, I looked pretty clean and a nice boy, and good little boy, but I knew my own heart, and I knew my own thoughts, and um, I knew that I was not good, and I thought about these things a lot. I thought about my own mortality. I thought about my eternal destination. As a kid, I, I just had these unique thoughts, or so I thought they were unique. They, uh, nobody else really shared those thoughts with me. Well, I didn't share them with the others for the most part either, but I was very sensitive to that, and I realized I would go to hell if I died. Um, I wasn't a particularly religious or, or uh, you know, religious person in the sense that we would go to church faithfully and, and all this stuff. We would go occasionally to church. I would go with my mom, but we were not, you know, it was it was just an occasional thing. Easter, Christmas, or Easter Christian, as they say. And I was always thrilled when it was over. I doodled while I was there, and I left very happy that it was over. Uh, often running to the car and sitting in the car while my mom chatted with other members of the church and finally came out, so... That was about the extent of it. But I was very sensitive, and I knew, I knew God was real. I knew he existed. Um, I, I did not doubt the Bible, but I didn't particularly read it or anything. Anyway, I, I sinned, uh, you know, um, I was doing bad things, and in my heart, thinking bad things and desiring bad things. I knew I'd go to hell, and I was always trying to figure out a way. I'm going to take these off and see if that's any better. Um I was always uh, trying to, to find that escape clause from hell, the loophole, so that I would not go to hell. Um, and uh, I knew in myself I wasn't good, and, and I thought, this, this was my initial escape plan. I thought, surely, after, say, a hundred trillion years in hell, surely God will let me out, right? Right? I mean, that, that's a long time to be punished, and surely at that point God would let me out of hell. And I don't know where I heard this verse. It must have been proclaimed from a pulpit one Sunday when I was at church doodling, and it entered into my 
heart and God nurtured it there. I did not know it. But this thought was answered my own thoughts uh, that I would be released from hell after a hundred trillion years. And that thought was uh, found in Hebrews 13, 8. I pulled it up here on my laptop. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. That thought entered into my mind as though there was an internal dialogue going on. And it answered the question. And it showed me that Jesus Christ said I would go to hell today. And he is the same. He said it yesterday. And he's the same today. He didn't change his mind. And he is the same forever. He's not going to change his mind. And I that that shut down that only loophole that I could come up with why I would not go to hell and, and suffer for my sins and my rebellion against God. And uh, so anyway, uh, you know, life went on and so forth. And uh, I went to see a movie, I believe it was around 1982, somewhere around there. Um, and it was uh, the film version of of the late the book the late great planet earth by Hal Lindsey and it was supposedly a prophetic book about it was about the end of the world and i didn't really know much about the book but i saw the previews for the movie and i thought the movie the pre previews made it look like it was a war movie and so i thought oh cool i i like war movies uh, patton the classics you know all that stuff midway uh, a bridge too far all those great classics you know of the 70s uh, and early 80s so I went to see it and to my much to my chagrin it was a a movie based on the book which basically gave no hope it was the end of the world Jesus Christ was going to return and destroy humanity destroy the world and the prophets have foretold it so have a nice day and as I remember the film, there was no hope in the film, but I took it to heart. Uh, I really absorbed it. I mean, the Jupiter effect and all this stuff, the planets were going to be aligned and great earthquakes and all this stuff. In 1982, this is when it's going to happen. And um, it really terrified me. And I took Paul's, <laughs> Paul's admonition, although I didn't know it at the time, I took it to heart. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, eat eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That was my mentality. And I shifted from good boy to rebellious teen, and I started you know, living it up because, hey, Armageddon's coming, and the, the this movie said so, and the prophets of the Bible say so, so I'm going to live it up before the wrath is poured out. So this obviously conflicted with, the, with good boy Ronnie. I got into trouble with my mom. I had done something, and she grounded me for two weeks and she had noticed this pattern of, of misbehavior developing and she asked she asked what was going on and i told her i said well we're all going to die in armageddon so time to party uh and uh she that wasn't the, what she anticipated as an answer um so she um she said okay i'll tell you what i'll make a deal with you if you will talk to the pastor our pastor of our church uh, then I will let you off the grounding. And uh, I thought that was a great deal. And uh, I said, can we get, you know, I didn't really say this, but hey, can we get this done by Friday? Because got some partying to do. So anyway, the pastor did come over. And I anticipated, you know, the, the normal pastoral, what I thought was the normal pastoral answer to naughty little boys and girls. Uh, and I thought, I thought that the dialogue would go something like this. And He'd say, now, Ron, you know, God wants you to be a good boy, to obey your mom and dad. And, and you really should do that to make God happy. And so uh, we're going to say a little prayer, a little power prayer. And I'm going to pat you on the head and you just change your ways now and be a good boy again. And so he came and we had a chit chat. And we sat at the dinner table. My mom sat across from me. My dad sat to my right, and then the pastor who was visiting sat on, on my left hand, right next to me. And so after the chit-chat, he says, So, Ron, I hear you believe that uh, Armageddon, uh, the end of the world, is coming very soon. And uh, you're concerned about that. And I said, Oh, yeah. I mean, I was an expert, right? I'd seen the Hal Lindsey film, so now I was a theologian. And I said, Oh, yeah, I saw the film, blah, 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 the prophets, blah, blah, blah. The end is coming. Jesus is going to destroy the world. There's no hope eat, drink, and be merry. And uh, he surprised me. The first surprise was his answer. 
because I expected him to resist that and say, oh, no, 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 Ronnie, that's not going to happen. He didn't say that. He said, well, you know what? It might well be very true that we are near the end of the world, that the la we're in the last days. It's very possible. But then he turned and made it a very penetrating question, a question I'd never heard before. Uh, it was never asked me personally, and it penetrated. And he said, Ron, let me ask you something. If you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? <laughs> no one had ever asked me that. And see, the reality in my heart, as I mentioned, I, I thought I was going to hell. And my loophole had been closed. Uh, you know, that after a hundred trillion years that Jesus would let me out of hell. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to tell him that, though. I didn't want to admit that I was going to hell. So I said, well, I... I quickly crafted a, a spiritual resume in my mind, as best as a 16-year-old boy could do. And I said, um, well, uh, I do go to church. Hello. I mean, you're our pastor, obviously. I pray sometimes. I embellished my resume for him, of course. I didn't tell him the part that when I did go to church that uh, I didn't like it, and I fled to the car once it was over uh, to avoid, you know, chit-chat with the religious folk. Uh, so I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a spiritual man, you know, I pray and I go to church and that's, that's about it. Is that good enough? You know? And, uh, he said, well, that, that's good. He, he kind of pushed the resume back and that, that's great, Ron. Great. Uh, but, um, let me ask you one more question. If you were to die tonight and God were to say, why should I let you into heaven? Why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And I said, I pushed the resume back and I said, I think it's all here on the page. <laughs> I think it's on my resume, the church and the prayer thing going on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, it didn't, it didn't phase him. It just bounced right off of him. And he then told me the gospel. He told me how Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. My sins were placed on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that Jesus Christ died in my place on the cross. He was punished for my sins. And that Jesus Christ died, shed his blood, and he was buried. And he was raised from the dead. And he said, Ron, if you'll believe that, if you'll receive that by faith, you'll have forgiveness of sins. You'll have eternal life. And you, when you die, you will go to heaven. You can know that. So it was very powerful. It was a very powerful moment because I knew about Jesus before. To me, the Bible was Jesus, Moses, and Noah, the, the big three, and they were kind of interchangeable. You know, Easter, you had Jesus. You know, and then you had Moses from the Ten Commandments always would be on ABC, right? The Sunday night movie, you know, Charlton Heston, classic. And Noah, the flood, the ark, and all that stuff. So it's just Bible characters and stuff. But this message of the gospel penetrated my heart in a powerful way. And he, so after he presented this truth to me, Ron, you can receive eternal life if you just believe the gospel the what I've just told you about Christ you just receive it by faith um then then he threw in the atomic bomb the shocker he said Ron would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your savior tonight so now he asked me personally now I've got to make a confession yes or no in front of my mother and my father and then we didn't do this stuff this was not our thing you know what I'm saying this was, you know, Christmas and Easter, how you doing, nice talk on Sunday. But we didn't go there. And this pastor went there with me. And I remember the horror of that question because I knew I was going to hell. And what that man just told me was powerful and true, and I knew it was true. And so he's asking me, do you want to receive it as tonight? Would you like to receive Christ as your Savior? And so I remember very quickly in this panic frenzy, like I looked at my mom, 
I looked at my dad, quickly th analyzing what are they going to say or think if I say yes. And then I turned back to the pastor and I was overwhelmed with the reality of that message. The truth of that message was so powerful to me at the age of 16. And I said, yes, I would. I would like to do that. And I didn't care what mom and dad said, because this was so powerful and real. I had perceived something in my spirit, in my inner man, that I had never considered or perceived before that moment. Even though I'd heard of Jesus, I understood that this was for me, that Christ died for me. It was no longer Jesus dying for the world and all the world stuff. It became an intimately personal that Jesus died for me on the cross. And was raised from the dead. And I said, yes, I would. And so I simply bowed my head in prayer with this pastor. And he led me in a prayer. And I, he said, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you just pray after me. And, and I did. And uh, uh, I raised my head up and, and looked around. And everybody looked the same. I looked the same. And, but I knew it was true. And I thanked him for coming out. And. He went on his merry way. You know, you know what? I never saw that man again. Um, he never followed up on me. I didn't go to church immediately after that because, I, in fact, what was very interesting, I broke out. At the age of 16, I broke out with shingles, right? All over my face, like on the high, whole right side of my face, I was like the elephant man in this grotesque, you know, hideous, uh, like monkey pox on steroids all over and it was precisely right down the middle of my face and I learned later it's the chicken pox virus that comes out uh you know it and it, it's dormant in your body and it can be triggered and come out and that came out on my face for two weeks I was at home and and, and sick and stuff and so I didn't even go to church after that in fact I went into I went into deeper sin after that for two years for two years after that I went oh no Three years after that, I went into deeper sin after that. And I thought I wasn't saved. I thought mm, God's mad at me now because I, I'm i doing all this stuff and everything. But I believed the gospel. And l let me let me say this. Uh, uh, let, me, let me wrap the story up and go back and add some detail. But So finally, after uh, three years of just pure carnality and... and uh, you know, running with the my high school buddies and doing the things that high school buddies do that are unsaved. I was participating with them and all this stuff. And um, um, decided to get married. And I, I said, you know, I told my wife, I said, or my, my fiance, I said, uh, you know, if we're going to have a, a good marriage, we really need to get into a church. We need to get connected with a church. And so she didn't object to that. And she agreed and so we started going to church and I don't know it was the first or second Sunday of going to church with my mom uh, as we were preparing to get married and the, the pastor was preaching I don't even remember what he was preaching on uh, I, there was a sin component and uh, it was uh, it was penetrating it was me he was talking to me there was no one else in this room he was talking to me <laughs> so I perceived it you know and just this this you know remorse for how I'd been living my life uh, after my conversion. And, and, you know, I went forward at an altar call at that point and, uh, uh, there was a major, uh, growth spurt at that point, uh, where I took my relationship with God ser more seriously. It, it was a sobering moment and a call to draw near to Christ in my own heart. And so, I did not, uh, I went through other crises of faith uh, after I'd done that and, and um, you know, wanted to, to establish a, a substantive relationship with Christ or walking with him. Um, I was immediately hit with the, blas the thought I had blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And so I went into a great depression, despair because of just some foolish things I'd done in the past. And it was in no way, shape or form, uh, the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but I but I believed I'd done that, and so 
Satan had me wrapped up, man. I, I was looking at gospel tracks. I go to all these different churches and try and find a, a track that would deal with the something that would relieve my burden of I'm, I'm going to hell again. I thought I was going to heaven. Now I'm going to hell because I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, the unforgivable sin and ah, and everything I found. Nothing gave me assurance or, or help. And so God used that crisis to drive me into the word. And so I've got to find the answer. So I started reading the Bible and God just powerfully, powerfully spoke to me through the scriptures and it might have been John 3, 16. I don't know the exact passage, but it was a whosoever will passage. And it was whosoever will believe has eternal life. That was that was the summary, right? It could have been anywhere out of John, probably John 3, 16. But uh, I read that verse. And again, internal dialogue with, with the Spirit of God. Ron, do you believe the gospel? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, I do. I do. As a, I'm wrestling through this in, in my own heart, wrestling with it. And then it, it dawned on me, if you believe, you have eternal life. So you could not have committed the unpardonable sin. And I call it the joy bubble. This joy bubble. Because I was very depressed for two weeks, man. I thought there's, I hear the loopholes closed again, man. You're going to hell. You committed the unpardonable sin. You cannot be saved. And your any hope you had of salvation is now gone. And now you can look forward to eternity in hell again. And that, that scripture dispelled that darkness and joy filled my heart, like indescribable joy. I was so happy. And I was so relieved of that burden. It just melted away from me. That lie, that bondage of Satan just fell away. And simultaneously, I knew I had not only not committed the unpardonable sin, but God revealed to me in that text, and that's always the way it is. It's in the text of scripture where he speaks to us. Okay. He revealed from that scripture, you have eternal life, you can never perish. But guess what that means? That means you have eternal life, never-ending life, not six months, three days, and two hours of life. You have eternal life, and you shall never perish, never perish. And I knew right then I could never lose my salvation is a twofer out of one verse. I got a double blessing. Number one, I realized I had not committed the unpardonable sin, and I've never worried about that since. And let me tell you, I'd have blasphemous thoughts come into my mind, blaspheming God. And I was just like, oh God, I can't stop these thoughts. And I was certain I'd blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And God set me free from that. And then secondly, um, I knew I couldn't lose my salvation. No preacher told me. No pastor on the TV or the radio told me. The Word of God told me. And that's very important, that you get a relationship with God yourself through the Word of God for yourself. Because you're going to have favorite preachers who are going to disagree with each other on a given topic. And if they're your source of, of communication with God or receiving truth from God, then you're thrown into a quandary. I, I respect both of these men, and they contradict each other on this point. What? Who's the truth? Well, if you establish your own relationship with God out of the Word of God yourself, then you're established. And now you can say, oh, Pastor A, whom I appreciate, is in error on this one, and the Pastor B is correct, because I've learned firsthand from the Word of God these things, and I can I can defend my position uh, through the Word of God, and I've shared my heart through the Word of God, not through Pastor A, B, or C, or whoever. So... Um, so anyway, a lot of growth, uh, from that time, 16, I'm 56 now. So 40 years, uh, 40 years of eternal life I've uh, lived and, uh, I've got eternity to go because remember with eternal life, you're always just beginning. Oh, wow. You're only just beginning. So when I'm in heaven for that hundred trillion years, I've only just started eternity. Boy, that's amazing. And God gives us that eternal life as a free gift. Now, I want to go back to my conversion story real quick, where I, I prayed the prayer. I prayed the sinner's prayer. And I didn't know, you know, I was like, okay, he's well, he's the he's the God man. I'm going to, you know, he, he's he's the the church guy, you know, uh, that's got the God talk. So I'm going to submit to him. And I prayed with him, and, and it was, a you know, there was nothing 
you know, that I remember being weird or wrong with the prayer. He, you know, led me to pray to Jesus, receive him. I don't remember the detail of that prayer. What I want to say is that prayer was superfluous. It was not necessary. Um, I believe that message. I believe that gospel message when he told it to me. And everything else was just the stress of, oh, wow, he's asking me to pray out loud. What's mom and dad going to think about that? And, 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 I, and I didn't know better. I just, I believed it when he told me the message. And the prayer was unnecessary. He could have gotten up and said, well, if you believe that message and you have eternal life, do you believe that message? Yeah, I do. Praise God, you've got eternal life. That's what the scripture says. That we believe. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And so I, I had eternal life before I even opened my mouth to say the prayer. And then I did spontaneously. I called my best friend, Nigel. Nigel, if you're seeing this video, you know this story pretty well. I called him up that night and said, Hey, Nigel, you're not going to believe what happened. His, we called him Oscar then. but I said, I trusted Christ. I got saved tonight. And he wasn't at that point in his life yet. He hadn't come to Christ yet. But he's saved now. But he like, okay, fruitcake. And uh, as I said, I got the shingles and then I continued to party. And so it didn't really, it didn't really factor in for a few years down, until a few years down the road. But um, I, I just spontaneously, I said, I got, I, in my heart, I wanted to tell him that. And that's the moment I received eternal life. Now, again, I'm going to come, I'm going to wrap this up. Wow, we're at 27 minutes. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. Easy believism. That's what I did. I believe the gospel. Okay. Let's, let's see what Jesus says here. Jesus says in John, John 3, 16, uh, I think you know the passage. Verse 15, whosoever believeth in him, in Jesus Christ should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that was this guy, believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know what believe means? It means to believe. Yep. Oh, it's deep. You know what faith means? It means to believe. Oh, it's deep. At the beginning, I, I just told you my story. Did you believe that? Or did you say, no, that's not true. I don't accept that story. If you accepted that story as truth, you believed the story I just told you. And it's a true story. That's how I got saved. It's a true story. You believed it. You received it into your heart as a true narrative. And that's what faith is. It's a transfer of truth. Truth being transferred to another person by from faith to faith. Right? And so the knowledge of Jesus Christ comes by the preaching of the gospel. That Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Listener, viewer, he was buried and he was raised from the dead the third day. And if you believe that, if you believe that Jesus Christ did that for you and it has appeased the wrath of God against you for your sins, and now you have peace with God through faith in Jesus, then guess what? God imputes his own righteousness to your account. You'll not perish but have everlasting life. It's that simple. You simply believe. It's easy believism. It's not hard believism. Difficult, impossible believism. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. People stumble over that. Don't stumble over it. Believe in easy believism. I believe in easy believism. And I believe Jesus died for my sins on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead. And I have, on the authority of the word of God, eternal life. My time's up here, guys. God bless. Uh, chat with me. Uh, I'd love to talk more about it. God bless. Bye.